tonight's uh, subject, special subject. And uh, I want to welcome everyone here in the Re Royal Bank Lecture Theater, as well as those who uh, may be viewing our video broadcast out, out there on the internet. As many of you are aware, the uh, Economic Development Steering Committee will be publicly announced uh, tomorrow and their schedule of public hearing hearings will be uh, made available to uh, all those groups and communities who want to take part in the public consultations. I want to take this opportunity to encourage members of the TAG to participate actively in this public consultation process so that the committee will have the benefit of hearing from those people who over the past few years have contributed the most to Cape Breton's emerging new economy. For over seven years, people who have been part of the TAG have been helping local firms expand their business networks, increasing community awareness of the new technologies being deployed in our region, and alerting new members, I'm sorry, alerting members to new business and employment opportunities. During much of that period, the attention of TAG has focused on our IT sector, not only because we've demonstrated that we're unusually innovative and good at designing and producing new media products, but also because IT fluency is fundamental to participation in the global knowledge economy, and because IT is an especially appealing way to reduce barriers to community acceptance of new kinds of employment in all technology-based businesses. Nevertheless, many members of TAG have developed a high level of expertise in other areas, such as environmental technology and lately petroleum technology. Therefore, I urge as many of you as possible to make the effort to share with the committee your insights into economic activities related to and supported by modern technology in which investments from the $80 million Economic Development Fund will have the most beneficial effect on the long-term growth of the island's economy. Before we get started on tonight's program, I just want to uh, make some uh, thank yous. Normally, uh, about quarter to seven, I am at the peak of ulcer-producing anxiety as we check out the video uh, broadcast on the internet and make sure that everything's ready to go. However, because I was giving part of the presentation tonight, I was out of the loop and I had to depend on a number of people who've done a superlative job, and I want you to be aware of who they are. There's Lee Singleton, the project coordinator for the chair, Amber White and Jennifer Burrell, Sean Petrie and, uh, Shane Petrie and Sean Breen, and also Parker McDonald and the staff of the Computer Services Department. Without them, uh, this might have been a shambles. It might be a, turn out to be a shambles. I don't know if that's happened in the past. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, before we get started also, I want to share with you something that was handed to me as I walked in and basically it purports to answer the eternal question, is it better to be a jock or a nerd? It, go, it makes a very exhaustive comparison of, of yardsticks with what Michael Jordan earns based on any number of uh, things like uh, while you're eating lunch, how much he makes and things like this. And it ends with the observation that in his last year, Michael Jordan made more than twice as much as all U.S. presidents in history did in all of their terms combined. Amazing. However, if Michael Jordan were to continue to save 100% of his income for the next 250 years, he'd still have less than Bill Gates has right now. <laughs> Game over, nerds win. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Jim Prince, for that. That's a uh, fun. Yeah. I'd love to see that, 
there's a, a, an issue with uh, Jim and I participating, and perhaps even you, because b the university will be uh, giving its own presentation, and uh, ECBC, of course, is, is uh, deeply involved in the whole process. But other than that, I see no reason why a group uh, uh, members of the TAG couldn't go, and I would think that if they were to put their heads together, uh, they could put on a dynamite presentation. Uh, I should make you aware that there will be two rounds of presentations. The first will be very brief. Uh, the university, for example, is already scheduled to give its hearing on November 2nd. I got that through a leak, uh, which isn't very far away, so you have, don't have much time to get ready for the first one, and you only have five minutes. On the other hand, uh, those who have a substantial input uh, and the committee, I guess, wants to hear more will be invited back for a second presentation, at which time I suspect they'll give you a great deal more time, especially if you indicate uh, in your first presentation that it would be very worthwhile for them to hear your inputs. So yes, and I tell you what, uh, after the presentation tonight, if uh, anyone is interested, please come and see me and we will do our best to contact everybody in the TAG over the next couple of days once we know what the schedule of hearings is and uh, we'll invite as many people as possible to get together and see if we can work something out. It'll be relatively short notice for the first one as I said but that's a great idea. Thank you Bob. Okay, has everyone picked up one of these little uh, folding, folded brochures? If not, they're on the front desk there. Uh, this is our attempt to give you something to take away uh, and something to uh, uh, feel that we uh, knew something about the subject. Um, let me uh, begin my overview by making the following uh, comment. Along about this time last year, many of us were worried that uh, not enough attention was being paid to the year 2000 problem and that we might want to have a, a theme throughout 1999 focusing on that issue. Uh, last uh, spring, I thought it was February or March, we did hold a panel discussion for non-experts by a group of eminent experts here locally, uh, moderated by Tom Campbell, and um, they brought us all up to speed on the status, whoop, the status of the uh, effort to avoid major social and and economic, could you turn lights on for a second? And, uh, ec economic dislocations after midnight on December 31st, 1999. To our relief, the panel assured us that the power company, the telephone company, the banks, and most of the larger uh, players had uh, done their homework and had uh, done their simulations so that we probably weren't going to be uh, confronted with anything more than a few inconveniences at worst uh, in the days following um, uh, 1999, uh, the beginning of year 2000. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that, well, as a result, the uh, year 2000 theme sort of faded into non-essential uh, hyperspace, and um, the panel discussion was a hit, though, and so this year, we've, we propose to undertake another theme uh, for 99 and the 99-2000 season, and that's a recurrent theme that we will hit time and again at different meetings, and it's uh, to meet a need which is not going to go away so quickly, and it has a very positive as well as, it's a two-edged sword. It has both positive and negative implications for us. The negative implications are that large corporations with the financial resources and technological clout will monopolize uh, the distribution of all digital products and e-commerce, and we'll end up with a uh, centralized hub and spoke uh, economy in which uh, those of us out here in Cape Breton will only be looked upon as uh, dumb terminals to a mainframe in some major city, and uh, all they care about is our credit card number as we swipe it through a little fixture on our keyboard. Alternatively, those of us here in Cape Breton who don't want to disappear so readily, uh, want to see a, a non-centralized or distributed web of peers type of economy. And uh, so tonight, we are kicking off the e-commerce theme with a brief overview by myself, and uh, since I'm not an expert on it, uh, I don't, shouldn't intimidate anybody, 
and um, also a panel discussion of a number of people who are engaged in what you would call e-commerce in different ways, and they will tell you what they are. And um, uh, it's intended to be, for those of us who wouldn't know a back-end interface from a front-end interface if we bumped into it. But nevertheless, uh, there are a number of things that I think worthwhile that we can tell you, and there are a number of resources that um, uh, those members like Sean and several people in my office have been hunting down that would be most, we thought, most helpful to those of you who want to do further exploration of the whole issue of conducting business on the internet. Now, what is the definition of e-commerce? Well, there are a bunch of them. Uh, I have a site here listed which has a bunch of, of uh, definitions, but the one that uh, struck me as most uh, relevant to our interests is the sharing of business information, the maintaining of business relationships, and the, the, and the conduct of business transi uh, transactions by means of telecommunications networks. It includes not only the buying and selling of goods, but also the conduct of various business processes within individual organizations as well as between related business partners which support buying and selling as a goal. And uh, maybe a little long, but it gets the idea across. It's not just buying and selling, it involves uh, business in a new media. Uh, whatever you want to consider e-commerce, it is getting very, very big. I do not have the latest statistics, but um, in 1996, the estimated total value of of uh, economic of um, e-commerce was 2.7 billion dollars. In 1997, it was 10 times as big, almost 21.8 billion. In 1998, it was estimated to be 74 billion. And uh, in the year 2002, it's expected to exceed a trillion dollars a year. Uh, it has been growing faster than the internet, and it is uh, uh, actually, there are so many uh, dimensions of it that are growing simultaneously that it's very difficult to get good numbers as to just all that's going on. But just to give you one example, one company, General Electric, has done in the last year $1 billion worth of e-commerce. Okay, now there are a number of barriers to, e to the growth of e-commerce that have been recognized, and I'll just uh, mention those. It is a lack of successful, profitable business models. We all hear about internet companies with uh, earnings to price, ratio, price to earning ratios of hundreds to one, and um, that uh, has affected user perceptions about the reality and the uh, merits of looking at e-commerce as a possible opportunity for their firms. Uh, there are also still some technology limitations, not the least of which is getting all of the software and hardware to work together and having the people who appreciate all that's involved. But accepting that that sort of par for the course in any new uh, field. Uh, let's go on and let me summarize uh, an overview that I've got here. This will all, by the way, be put on the TAG website and you'll be able to download it and we will continue to develop uh, the resources of that e-commerce uh, page and anyone who has some suggestions, please email them to the, to the chair and we'll, uh, we'll put them up on the uh, site for the benefit of everyone. First of all, uh, I want to point out, could you go back to the previous slide, that there are two aspects to electronic commerce. The physical economy, uh, growing tomatoes, putting them on trucks, taking them to stores and selling them, is not going to disappear. You can't eat bites. Pun. Um, but anyway, uh, the physical economy can and is being enhanced with information technology uh, uh, components. So although the physical economy is not what you would call part of the digital economy, it is part of e-commerce. The second is the digital economy, that is new kinds of business largely involving the uh, distribution and sale of information, entertainment, things like that, is growing rapidly and that is a second aspect and that is not just supported with 
information technology that is in fact uh, mediated through and it's completely tied up with information technology. But don't forget that you can run a regular business and improve its performance, reduce costs, uh, re improve efficiency, uh, develop client bases and things like that the same way as you could normally but more efficiently. It's another channel for developing your company. It also opens up new kinds of uh, revenue generating uh, opportunities once, you're, once you got your toes wet and you've dived into the deep end of the pool. Um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, there are a number of primary business functions, and, and I want to stress that business functions, the people who are doing best on the Internet are not people who are focusing on the, uh, on the technology of selling. They are so focusing on the selling, and then they are co co collaborating with the people who are providing the infrastructure and the software and doing the uh, nuts and bolts part. So it's a partnership or marriage of business and technology, but the business interests are, must lead uh, or else you have a very fancy but uh, rapidly ending business. Uh, so I've just listed here what are considered to be some of the more common uses of uh, the internet and especially web-based uh, uh, solutions, software and uh, graphical ways of doing things. Uh, online bidding and tendering. Uh, the whole area of EDI is, is shifting onto the internet because the internet uh, e-commerce is growing so much more rapidly than EDI and I've included EDI as electronic interchange. It's a way of integrating business processes without using paper. Uh, Ford Motor Company, for example, puts out a, a tender, people bid on it, uh, it, it, it selects a, uh, a winner, they uh, agree to a contract, contract is sent, signed, the work is done, updates are sent, specifications are, are, are exchanged, designs are, are reviewed, and the product is uh, ultimately shipped and uh, an invoice is sent, and then the money is electronically deposited into the subcontractor's bank account. So that's what EDI has been doing very, very well, but one of the problems was it was, you required a, um, uh, a closed network, a proprietary network, and on the internet, of course, anybody can participate because it's an open network. But all e-commerce runs on networks. That's an uh, important observation. Okay, um, <clears throat> now, the next, uh, there's a second tier of functions that people engage in, uh, research, um, collating information, comp looking for what competitors are doing, uh, engaging in financial transactions of a, spe of a particularly uh, special and effective way, uh, cyber cash, digital cash, things like that, uh, reducing the involvement and the costs, the involvement of uh, complex processes and uh, people and reducing the cost. Uh, there are issues of security that you have to engage in or take care of. You have to know something about telecommunications, or somebody does. Uh, a lot of people are using it for product development. We have uh, small companies at uh, Silicon Island who work with their client online to review uh, and define products and also to deliver products. It would be very nice if we had a much bigger pipe, but uh, they still manage to do some of that. There are other things such as copyright and decision support and data warehousing and mining because one of the beauties of e-commerce is you can just collect every keystroke and store it in a database and then depending on your interests or needs you can see what uh, 35 to 40 year old men who are college educated are buying from your offerings as compared with uh, uh, 60 to 65 year old um, uh, women who are buying other things from your, your, your uh, offerings. Um, and lastly, there are things like conferencing, which are functions that all businesses have to engage in. And it's important to notice that it, there's like an analog between regular business operations and then you just transfer it over into a digital world and sometimes it's better, uh, such as uh, fast uh, electronic transactions with no paper, and sometimes it's not so good, like teleconferencing where you have 
uh, not necessarily a big enough bandwidth. Uh, I have to confess we were going to try to have a panelist uh, participate tonight via a teleconferencing system from Halifax, but it turns out we just didn't have the bandwidth and the system we were using gave priority to uh, the video rather than the sound and even though you got freeze frames, uh, freeze speech doesn't work. So uh, we, we had to drop that and that's a limitation that you, you run into. Okay, next uh, there are a number of what are called components of e-commerce. Uh, e There's currency and uh, I want to draw to your attention a book which I have found particularly helpful. It's called Electronic Commerce. It's uh, cited uh, at the back on the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, brochure and uh, Fred White, Professor White in our business technology program has put on the reserve shelf for his course uh, Introduction to Business a, a number of e-commerce texts that are extremely uh, valuable. They're just great books. Uh, for some reason, e-commerce brings out the best in um, business professors who write textbooks. It's, they're really good. And so if you are really interested and want to follow it up, don't hesitate to follow up some of these uh, links and also to come into the university and, and check at the circulation desk. Um, uh, by, for example, this, this book, one of the nice parts about this book is it talks about a lot of the different ways that people are exploring cyber cash, digital cash, micropayments, millicents. I mean, one of the points about buying and selling, as you'll hear from Alan Leith, is that they ding you every time that somebody uh, gives you their credit card number. You, the merchant, have to pay a fee to uh, Visa or, or MasterCard. What happens if, the, and it may be a dollar, for each transaction. What happens if the uh, what you're selling is data from the Beaton Institute archives and uh, you are only charging 10 cents to have a page printed and sent to the person out of a document in a genealogy file? Well, you have to have, a, other, have, to have other ways that are much less uh, cost intensive to uh, enable people to make those uh, purchases without being inhibited by the overhead of the cost. Uh, catalogs are a very common thing and we've listed a large number of uh, links that show different types of business operations and some very, very value-added functions on catalogs. So for example, if you go to www.landsend.com, which is a clothing, uh, sort of a high-end uh, uh, yuppie clothing um, catalog, mail order catalog, you can put in your measurements and it'll create a mannequin of your shape and then you can see what a particular uh, dress or a particular jacket would look on, like on you if you were to buy it. Uh, if you go to some hairstyling uh, sites, which we don't have here, you can put you know, an Elvis mop on your head or an afro or something and see what you'd look like if you got that kind of a hairstyle. Um, very, very important, increasingly important to large corporations and small businesses are intranets and extranets. An intranet is a, uh, a network, like a land, local area network, which works with web technology and enables staff, executives of, uh, at all levels to access easily information, to communicate, and to, um, to conduct transactions that are necessary for the normal operation of the business. Uh, then extranets are like an intranet, except they, you have a portal that goes to the internet, and between the, the intranet and the, the internet is uh, some sort of security barrier, a proxy server, uh, a firewall, a number of uh, authorization filters, so that uh, different buyers can come in and look at different aspects of your products or different suppliers can come in and look at your inventory and say, oop, you're getting kind of low in model 33, I, I'll ship you 40 of them right away and I'll, f I'll bring, send the other 10 tomorrow. And many auto parts stores are doing that. When the level gets below a certain amount, they have agreed to allow the supplier to s automatically send enough inventory to to replenish their need. And that saves an, an awful lot of purchasing and, and uh, ordering and paperwork. 
but also you can use the internet if you're the purchasing agent to go out and compare prices very quickly. So uh, it's, it's very nice for a company. In fact, some companies are getting so sophisticated that they view their suppliers and their customers as business partners so that customers send in their complaints or their suggestions or their, their desires for new, t new models or new, new, new features and that automatically is incorporated into the, the next product planning cycle. Okay, uh, there are a number of business models that have been tried and uh, a number of them are extremely successful. Amazon.com is one, uh, I shouldn't say it's extremely successful, it's extremely large. Um, chapters, uh, there was an interview on TV the other night, they indicated they haven't made a lot of money yet, but they sure are expecting to, and they, didn't, they don't regret one bit the amount, the 10 million or whatever it was it cost them to get into a uh, e-commerce uh, uh, process. But this is the sort of range of business activities, uh, next, next uh, back one here that people get into, have been doing, and um, one I left off, I forgot about, is uh, human resources, recruitment, putting out notices of jobs. Uh, Media Spark, for example, recently gave out uh, three job uh, excuse me, 18 job descriptions and uh, invited people to apply and send their, their resumes in for various positions. Um, so, uh, a large number of these uh, activities you'll recognize, travel and reservations, but what about the local, you know, maritime Mar Marlin travel? Are they going to go to business if uh, Easy Saber can do it all for you online? Don't know yet. Depends on what Mar maritime Marlin decides to do. Um, but uh, certainly, those of you who have tried online banking, it's very nice to be able to just click on a button and pay your bills. Uh, to the power company or the telephone company or Canadian Tire or whatever. All right, an issue which a lot of people, uh, shall we go to the next, oh, wait a minute, what's this? Oh yes, this is one I, I uh, didn't get a print of. Um, these are aspects of security um, and th that people worry about. Authentication that you are who you are, things like digital signatures, uh, authorization, that is, how do you give somebody authority to go into certain areas but not other areas, and how do you modify that easily? I mean, like anybody who's ever developed a website, it's one thing to develop a website and put it on. It's another to keep it fresh and up to date and, and change it and add things to it and take things away as they uh, become outdated. So management of the information has to be done, and uh, Ian may uh, give us a little insight as to the way that they make available to their clients the ability to manage the content and the processes on their own sites. There's an issue of confidentiality. I heard a major discussion last night on uh, CBC uh, radio about um, the fact that uh, more and more people are being, uh, they're, they're, everything they do is being recorded and companies are not just using this to make it easier for the person who comes to come the next time to um, uh, use their credit card without having to register it a second time, but they're using it to do all sorts of profiling of you in relationship to others. But worse, many of them are many of them are sharing this information and selling it without your permission. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with someone developing statistical models of purchasing uh, purchasing patterns and things like that, but if they're using information that you gave them, personal information, which you, and you're not aware, then there is a major issue of informed consent, and uh, I'm sure all of you have been spammed by uh, suspicious um, uh, email that starts out in the subject line with dollar, 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 or sex, 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 or whatever, and I hope it isn't a reflection of uh, what people think are my uh, surfing habits, but uh, <laughs> In any case, uh, that's what they can do now. Uh, if you, half of the e email spams I get now uh, offer to sell you 17 million email addresses and the software to send one message to every one of them with one push of the button. 
So uh, there's, there's some real issues of there. There's an issue of integrity, that is, is the person you're buying it from who he says he is? Is she going to do what she says she does? And what happens if this person in Bulgaria doesn't ship the product that you sent the money for? What do you do? Well, that gets into the leg legalities of it. But uh, many companies, Microsoft, uh, some of the major companies, are very sensitive to this, and uh, Netscape is another one, and make it very clear to you when you are approaching a sensitive transaction and what options you have, you can refuse it, you can accept it, you can accept it conditionally, things like this, and they will tell you what they will use that information, wh what they will do with that information once you give it to them. And that suggests, implies a great deal of integrity and responsibility on their part. <coughs> One of the problems that uh, we will have to resolve is repudiation. That is, if you order something and then you change your mind and you say, oh, I don't want that, I just bought it on impulse, you right now can't cancel the order that easily. Once you send the, the uh, credit card number through, a lot of things happen very quickly and the money comes out of your account and the book is on its way without having been touched by human hands um, before you can even breathe. So. Uh, there's an issue then of, of uh, wanting to have a little bit of buffering in the system to allow for modification of your interests and, uh, and um, uh, what you'd like to do. Um, and then there are perceptions of trust uh, that people are uh, uh, trying to uh, satisfy. And uh, if you read books on e-commerce, if you... Uh, subscribe to uh, Wired magazine and other magazines. If you go to some of the sites on here that deal with some of the more um, uh, broad-based aspects of, um, of e-commerce, you will see that there are peer-reviewed articles on the whole issue of, um, of uh, user perceptions and what can be done to allay anxieties that this is not very reliable, not very dependable, not very good, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of it is resistance to the, the, the unfamiliar and the new, or some of it is anyway. Now, legalities, um, uh, as, especially as we go into international uh, business, and of course, what's e-commerce for if it's not to uh, allow you to participate in the global uh, internet economy? Um, Issues of how to provide digital signatures, how to uh, sign and, uh, and uphold contracts, um, to enforce them in courts of law, intellectual property protection, uh, taxation issues. What, uh, you know, it, it's fraught with opportunities for people to do, uh, you know, getting involved in the gray market where you do something for me, I do something for you, and Revenue Canada doesn't, doesn't see any of it, so it doesn't get any of the sales tax or the GST or your income or anything else, income tax or anything else. And some of those issues are addressed in the o OECD reports uh, where bi both business and um, uh, government and uh, private non-government -pri organizations who are interested in promoting international business are addressing protocols and standards which uh, uh, com countries, all sorts of countries, are now signing on to. Canada is playing an extremely active role in this, uh, partly because it's the most wired country in the world. Something like 60% of all homes have computers, and something like 40% of all Canadians are now using the Internet. It's more than the United States, probably more than anywhere in the world. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it offers all sorts of opportunities for us to take uh, take. Uh, to overcome the disadvantages of being spread out in a large country and yet still uh, well-educated and sophisticated in the uses of technology. Uh, and so Canada has taken a leading role in promoting uh, e-commerce both on the national and international level. And then the last uh, slide I want to have, I want to show is the fundamental rule of e-commerce. Do it well or don't do it at all. Because if you think you can impress 
50 million people with your little tiny company by having a super duper website, you're right. But you can also unimpress 50 million people just as easily. Uh, there are issues of attractiveness, design. There are issues of reliability. Uh, you do something and it, it doesn't work right the, one time after another. There are issues of, of user friendliness. And then there are these other more uh, uh, business or irregular or, uh, issues of legalities and, uh, reli and uh, dependability and things like that. But one of the rules, and they've, I've seen examples of companies who have said, yippee, everybody else is doing it. I've just decided I'm going to do it. I read the Forbes uh, editorial that said, um, get on the internet because if you're not, you're going to be able to business within five years because all your competitors will be on the internet. And so I dove into this site uh, by, um, on the cheap, and the net result was I got what I paid for, and it is a pimple on the nose of an otherwise very attractive uh, face or image we want to project. So I leave it at that, uh, and now what I'd like to do uh, is um, ask you to just sort of uh, think over what I've been talking about and look at some of the uh, sites or some of the issues in here and jot down somewhere uh, any questions you might have or might have come with and um, uh, be prepared to ask our panel. And we'll take a couple of minutes now for them to uh, gather and get seated. It'd be very informal, and Jim will give you the, um, the rules of engagement. Okay. <laughs> okay, could you come up and I'll introduce you when you're seated. Okay, I just want to uh, mention uh, when we get to the question period, each panelist is going to give a little presentation and a little few comments, and then we're going to open the floor for questions, both from uh, uh, questions <coughs> that you can address to Paul or to the panelists. But what I'd ask you to do, because we're recording this, is uh, just raise your hand and I'll bring the mic down to you, or I'll throw it down depending on uh, your athletic abilities, and then... Um, if you would identify yourself, who you are, what your company is, or whatever, and, um, and then ask your question. But don't ask your question until you get the mic, because we're recording this and we need it. OK, Paul. Uh. OK, uh, first what I'll do is I'll introduce each of the panelists and, and, ask, yeah. and ask them to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about themselves and, and, and what they do and the company they work with and what they do there, and what the company's interest in e-commerce is, and uh, sort of a sense of what their contribution can be to any questions you might ask tonight, okay? So on my immediate left is Ian Robertson, who is managing partner for, <laughs> managing partner for Chatsubo Design, a local firm down at Silicon Island. Okay, well, like you said, I'm Ian Robertson. Um, Chatsubo was formed uh, five years ago uh, with uh, partners Jamie Folds and uh, John Hussey. Uh, we very early on got into the development of uh, online database applications, uh, websites that are dynamic and uh, respond to users' input and uh, also allow um, our clients to go in using a web-based uh, back-end and manage the information. And there's a whole variety of applications that, uh, that this type of technology is uh, useful for, one of which in particular is e-business. I, I, uh, I tend not to like the, uh, the term e-commerce because uh, I never in my life have said I'm going to set up a commerce. I'm going to set up a business. And uh, e-business is just an extension of your business. So I, I prefer the term e-business. Um, with that, I think I'm going to just pass it along and uh, look forward to some questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there you go, to, to Ian's left is Margaret Williams. Margaret is uh, with MediaSpark, another firm at uh, Silicon Island, 
uh, president is uh, Matt Giorgio, and they've been, well, I'll let Margaret tell you the details. Okay, uh, I'm the director of operations at MediaSpark, which is kind of uh, chief gopher, because we get to do everything. But MediaSpark is a software development multimedia company, started in 1994 by Matthew Giorgio. And we are really rolling right now, we're gathering quite a bit of a momentum. But we have our own line of in-house products. In addition, we do client services, which range from custom software, websites, databasing solutions, uh, <coughs> and even onto print and image design work, because what we've found is that your business has to span both the classic, uh, tangible environment, the printed brochures, as well as the electronic environment. Our main products that uh, we're actually releasing two major products this fall. One is a re-release of a product called Knowledge Weaver, which is an internet in the classroom product, and it has been totally re-engineered from its original release, and it's now internet distributed um, product, which plugs into your local web browser on your own machine. The other product, which uh, Paul allowed me to do a little commercial plug for here, is GoVenture, which is our entrepreneurship simulation. And we really believe that this is one of the most innovative, if not the most innovative, simulation on the market today. We've already had quite a bit of international interest in the product. It's uh, going to be sold on CD-ROM, and it's targeted for uh, initially for education markets. But this simulation is so comprehensive that we've included the issues of balancing your personal life and your business life in the simulation. So you have to set up your family, and if you have a spouse and you miss the anniversary, your stress level goes up. And if you work too hard, you get sick, and the program tells you you're not going to work tomorrow. So it's really a very comprehensive program that gets through all the business aspects of living the life of the entrepreneur, as well as uh, encompassing this into your, your personal life. Uh, in terms of e-business, we do a lot of e-business ourselves, aspects of our business. We have software in over 170 countries by the last count, which has been distributed over the internet. And uh, as Paul mentioned, we have recently done um, employment by using the internet. There are a lot of efficiencies, but I think everyone has to pick and choose what works for their company. And I do have to kind of end this little uh, preface by saying I'm not a technical person. I'm the business person. I work with our developers, uh, so I'm not going to be able to give you any technical answers. But the real key thing that we're talking about here is technology is the medium. It is not the product. It is not the service. And you have to understand your business, apply solid business principles and thinking, and then find the right technology and only enough technology that you need uh, to deliver that. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, to Margaret's left is Spiro Triffis. Spiro Triffis is an architect. Uh, I first saw Spiro when he took us all on a virtual walk through this building, and I was absolutely blown away by the sense of immediacy and reality uh, like I had never felt before in, uh, in any kind of a demonstration of a, what a new building will be like. And uh, Spiro uh, is another company. He's one of the major companies in uh, Silicon Island. Spiro, would you? Thank you, Paul. <coughs> um, as Paul uh, mentioned, I'm an architect. And uh, I'm kind of the uh, odd person up on this table here in the fact that we're not actually uh, selling uh, products directly or services directly that are uh, internet based, but we are finding that in our profession, it is profoundly being impacted by the internet. Over the last few uh, months especially, we found that more and more of our uh, data transfer is not going out by fax or by courier or by uh, blueprint anymore, uh, but everything is going on via the internet. And we are currently in the process of, we're struggling with various issues of how do we coordinate and manage uh, large construction projects with the vast quantity of data that has to be 
coordinated and integrated into uh, some sort of a database that is readily accessible by all the team players, the contractors and owners and so forth. Uh, there's always the uh, dilemma of whether uh, you build your own extranet or whether you sign on with a major company that is providing um, a PCN service or project collaboration network as uh, we refer to it. So the uh, methodology of uh, organizing and delivering uh, major projects, whether it's in the building industry or whether it's in the product design and manufacture industry, uh, where you have large teams that have to coordinate and collaborate, inevitably the consumer is paying for that collaboration that is being conducted over a new type of network, and that network is the internet. And so um, we've been very fortunate in, in terms of our involvement uh, with Silicon Island that we've been exposed to a lot of new uh, systems and procedures that has enabled us to uh, be at the forefront. But once again, uh, with uh, the internet, it's always a question of uh, where is the next step going to be taking us and, and are we uh, investing our time and money wisely in the different decisions that we're making. Thank you, Spiro. Uh, and fi last but not least is Alan Leith. Alan is a small business owner. Uh, he's been in uh, regular business for many years. Uh, I knew Alan through his uh, being a radio amateur, and then, of course, when the uh, computer and the internet came together, he got enthusiastic about that. He has turned his uh, interests uh, and expanded his business using uh, e-commerce and he has struggled through all of the issues that any of you might have to go through if you were to take a small business and try to get it online and try to make it a successful uh, business both on and off the internet. Uh, Alan? Thanks Paul. One of the things I'd like you to all do before we do anything else here this evening is take a pencil out and turn this thing over to the back and add my <laughs> website. I forgot. I was going. <laughs> Sorry, Alan. He's got everybody here but me. I'm crushed. Well, no. The point was, I went to <laughs> www.cddepot.com, and it wasn't you. That's right. It's not. It's a guy, believe it or not, in Albany, New York. And he and I have already had a fight about this. <laughs> anyway, I decided that CD Depot should become the Compact Disc Depot, <coughs> and we are now CompactDiscDepot.com. A whole lot easier to find than trying to remember CD Depot and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. As Paul said, I got into the Internet uh, as a business opportunity uh, when the Internet was just getting started with e-commerce, per se, and I ended up... Uh, through a mutual friend of, of Paul's and, and mine, uh, going to Chatsubo, and uh, Jamie and Ian and John designed a website for me. I think possibly, if I remember correctly, in one of the, the very first databases that uh, uh, went online. Yeah, yeah, certainly within the first five. And we have done an incredible amount of business over the internet in the last four years. Uh, my retail store obviously is on Charlotte Street in Sydney, but the catalog is updated on a weekly basis and is available literally in every corner of the world. So it's not terribly uncommon for me to get uh, orders coming in from Australia and the Philippines, from all parts of uh, uh, Europe and uh, certainly every state of the United States. In fact, I had a phone call yesterday morning from a gentleman who said, I saw you last week when you had your road show at uh, Celtic Colors in the deck, and I bought a copy of each of the Stan Rogers uh, CDs from you. He said, I've been listening to them since I got back home, and he said, can you tell me if the song, The Mary Ellen Carter, is based on a real story, or is it something that Stan Rogers wrote from his own uh, experiences or whatever in, in Canso? I said, I don't know. So if anybody happens to know the answer to that question, uh, I can call the guy back. I said, can I email you? And he said, no, you can't. He said, I don't own a computer. I said, you're kidding. 
he said, I do not own a computer, so I have to telephone the guy. He lives in Palo Alto, California. And he called me yesterday afternoon. So if I can get an answer for him by the end of tonight, both of us will be very happy campers. We um, put uh, Eagle, a uh, Unix server, on the internet, and it was something between the 300th and 400th web server in the world. At that time, Chatsubo was the first uh, developed first website for uh, Fitzgerald Studios with their uh, Lewisburg uh, CD-ROM. There are now something like 15 million internet hosts in the world and about 300 million websites. Uh, that tells you how much the growth has been since mid-1993. So I just want to put that into perspective so that if we assume this is to that first presentation at the TAG meeting uh, in 1993, then five years from now you can imagine what e-commerce is going to be. Okay. Okay, the floor is open for questions. So. Uh just raise your hand, I'll give you the mic, and uh, you can ask either Paul or the panelists. Just identify yourself and uh, who, what you, yeah, ask your question. Okay, meeting adjourned, everybody go home. Oh, there we go at the back. Um, my name's Paul Rice, and I'm wondering about, in this new global economy, how you manage to deal with any language problems with communication. I guess, it, is it enough that we, that we use English? Uh, I, I'm considering putting a web page for my own business, and I'm thinking that there are 30 million Canadians, and there are a billion Chinese. So should I be thinking about learning Chinese now? Um, i try and take that one. Uh, my first piece of advice is don't put a website up in a language that you can't respond in because you will get people talking to you and communicating you with you in that language. Uh, English is a very large proportion of an international language of trade. In fact, um, in most of the Pacific Rim countries, the Asian cultures use English amongst themselves because some of their dialects are so close they would not be understood if they spoke in their own dialects or they've, they've had uh, uh, homonyms in one language which means something totally different in their other language. So uh, they have used English. Um, certainly if you have a particular market that you know it deals in a foreign language and you want to serve it well, you should provide yourself with the facilities that deal with that language. But um, again, if you want to start out in English, if your products are in English, uh, we've recently had uh, an inquiry on our uh, GoVenture simulation from uh, South America where they're interested in having people there learn the English terminology of doing business with North America. So they are, a lot of the world is, is coming to do business in English. So I would start with English and as you branch out and identify your markets. I mean, we've had uh, a customer communicate with us in Italian, and it's been kind of hard, but they'd send an Italian email, and we'd respond in English, and they'd send another Italian email. We sort of figured it out. <laughs> you just have to put I.O. on everything. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> While Jim is going up there, I should mention that the, the web address for Chatsubo is www.chatsubo.com. For MediaSpark, it's www.mediaspark.com. Uh, Spiro, www.trifus.com. And you've just been told by Alan uh, that his is uh, compact. It's not www, it's compactdisc.com. Oh, you have to have the w oh, w www. Oh, well, www.compactdisc.com. So you can go look at their site. I'm curious how many of you actually uh, harvest the data that's in your log files and if you analyze it, and if so, with what respect do you analyze it and, and what do you do with the results? For those who may not know what a log file is, Sounds there are a number of there products you which you can get statistics on who has come to your site, what links they have clicked, and 
uh, what they have been particularly interested in, and you can add them all up and get them by the hour, by the, the, the uh, domain uh, name, and things like that, all sorts of ways. Uh, as you can do administrative statistics. Um, okay, there's, there's two sides to collecting data that relates to your website. One of them is just to get a, a numerical statistic of how many people are coming and kind of generally what areas of the world they're coming from. Um, and it's all based on domain names. Anything with like an edu or a com or a net domain name, they're all going to show up as originating from the US. Anybody coming in with a, a .ca domain name, say somebody who dials up through uh, istar.ca, they'll be identified as Canadian or UK as, as U UK. So log files collect all this data and you can have a, a fairly comprehensive report on where people enter your site, uh, the path they take through your site and where they exit your site. It's useful for determining what areas of your site are more popular, less popular. Uh, we do a lot of music artist sites and we put on uh, uh, sound clips and video clips and one of the things that all the artists are always really interested in is finding out which one of their songs is most popular of course so they can get that type of statistical data and uh, we usually run um, typically run a stats run beginning of every month on every one of our sites and just make that available to our clients uh, and they can just go to a URL that isn't readily uh, uh, addressed to the public uh, kind of a, a secret URL, if you will, and, uh, and view that right online. Uh, the other data collection, I think that, that Ron is a little bit more interested in hearing a response on, is the personal type of information and whatnot that may be collected by one of the database applications that we might create. So if a customer or somebody who becomes a member of your site registers, uh, once a person actually registers with your site and they come in with a, a username then you can attract their you can track their activity from session to session to session so they can come in this week and they can come in next week and you still know who they are so you can start to gather information on their buying habits and what they've bought and when they've bought it um, and one of the th things that that's really useful for is potentially upselling them uh, if somebody buys blue widgets six times throughout the year and you've got a sale on blue widgets, well, you might want to send that person an email saying, we got them on special this month. Uh, one of the things we always encourage our, our clients to do is if they do have some sort of a policy or plan on uh, sharing that information with other business partners or whatever, that uh, that policy is something that's clearly stated on your website because there's a lot of fear generated in the general public about what are these people doing with my information. And I've been in a few strategy sessions lately where a lot of this topic has come up. And basically my response to my client is, if you can give them a valid reason why they might want to give you that data in the first place, if it's going to make their visit better or if it's going to make your relationship with them better, then go ahead and ask for it. But if you're just going to ask for it just for the fun of having it, they're probably not going to want to give it to you. Anybody else? Can I just uh, add a couple of things to that? I would never presume to use the information that I get from Chatsubo in terms of the people who visit my site uh, to send them any email about anything that I have that they might be interested in. I will, however, and do send information out by email to customers who have purchased something from me. But that's as far as I will go with using that kind of that data. Uh, it is rather interesting to see where all of these people are coming from, as Ian has said. But uh, as far as going beyond that, uh, at this particular point in time, I wouldn't even, even consider to, uh, to uh, do anything with that information. Uh, there was one other thing, Ian, that, uh, that you said in terms of uh, uh, statistical data as well. Uh, we have had uh, something close to 22,000 hits on our site, and uh, that's a pittance compared to 22,000 hits an hour, for instance, uh, at something like uh, Amazon.com or CD Now. Both of those 
uh, operations utilize information from customers and will send you email very frequently uh, once you've made a purchase or two or three and they will determine from what you have bought what kind of music you happen to be interested in and they'll send you lists of all the new things you should be buying and that's a very very handy marketing tool so that kind of information is used again based on purchases um, I agree with uh, what's been said here with Ian and his opening comments about web statistics I like to remind everybody about that wonderful quote about there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Be very <laughs> careful about use of web statistics. Um, they are good for indicating general trends. Um, now, that is opposed to the specific data that you can elicit, as Ian was saying, about specific customers. And this is becoming a, a fine art. This is part of the the e-business that is really changing marketing approaches because the newest term, of course, is mass customization, uh, which is an oxymoron in terms of the English language. But with the data collection that these large systems are able to do, they can really customize down to individual likes and order patterns. Uh, so there is that option down the road. Again, as, as Ian said, I, I would underline that you want to make your policies clear and upfront. Uh, I've seen more and more websites with a checkbox saying, I, I do or do not want to you know, get emails from you about product information and this and that. Like you used to get on your credit card bills about if you wanted to get mail from other companies, same type of a thing. We uh, do collect information on customers, on people who download our software. We've used it for marketing purposes. We've used it for statistics. It's very useful to be able to promote your company and identify where your products are, where your customers are. So there are many internal uses that can be used from the data you collect without having to go back to them uh, as a direct selling technique, but that is also open to you. Uh, my name is Harry Dowell. I'm the general manager of Northeastern Trading Company. We're just in the process now of setting up a, a website, a catalog, if you will, to do e-business. I'm learning very quickly the, <laughs> the headaches of it. Uh, for those people that may be here tonight considering doing this, uh, maybe it's because of the lack of a little bit of research. Um, but I have found out since the development started, the cost of developing such a site to sell numerous, numerous products uh, can be very expensive. I suppose you can do a very cheap job too, uh, but it looks that way uh, when you're finished. Could we um, possibly get some r um, rough figures that uh, this type of thing might cost somebody? I know what they're costing me. <laughs> <laughs> I know what they're costing me, but... Uh, uh, 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Add some zeros. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's two parts to the cost of, of uh, having a website. One is what you talk about, the development, which is the upfront time that it takes for any website developer to create the pages, create the, the database uh, systems that run the website, and then there's an ongoing hosting fee. The hosting fee isn't really that much of uh, a big deal. The, the big deal is the, uh, the development. Uh, I get, oh, I can't count how many calls I get uh, a week. How much is a website? I say, oh, yeah, how much is a car? How long is a string? Um, uh, it can, uh, we do websites, uh, you know, that range between $500 and $50,000. And it depends entirely on the scope of what you want to do. Uh, I think that it's um, part of the job and, and the responsibility of any web developer uh, to be pretty clear about the scope of the project um, right out of the gate. Uh, what we try and do is get a feel for uh, the scope of your business and what kind of budget you have to put towards uh, an investment in internet, in internet technology. Um, and then it's our job to try and 
provide something that's going to be that's going to provide the best solution for that amount of money. Uh, not everybody operates on the same scale, and, and it's up to you know, I believe that it's our job to uh, consult with you and give you the the best uh, possible solution we can that fits your business model and and your budget. Um, a store, if you want a, a round figure, uh, if you were to walk in and say I'd like a a store that has a uh, hundred items um, it's a fairly simple structure they're all individual items ie it's not a case that I have an item that is a sweater that's available in four colors and three sizes uh, because that's really 12 items um, I would probably give you a figure of about 10 grand as a ballpark uh, if anybody wants a a firm quote on something, I'd be glad to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> is there an entry and upgrade strategy that someone who wants to dip their toe into the pool and then sort of get deep, more deeply immersed as they get more experience and begin to understand what all yeah. is involved? Yeah, we have, uh, have clients who've, who've begun at like the six, $700 level, and we've got websites that are in their third revision now, um, people who've started off really light. They want to dip their toe in the water and get a feel for it and, uh, and find out if there's any interest for what they're doing. And uh, I like when someone comes in and, and wants to start off that way because it shows that they have a real practical knowledge and they haven't been bamboozled by like these IBM ads that say, I'm going to get on the net and make a million dollars. Because it's just, you know. So to summarize, Ian, what Ian said is the bigger your budget, the more costs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, okay. Um, again, uh, just to confirm that Ian is not just the only one saying this, uh, what he has just said is, is very true, dead on. Um, what we often recommend to people developing websites is to look at it in a phased approach because the first thing is you have to figure out what you can handle on the back end side of it. Um, you don't want to open a huge... Uh, I guess the word is now e-tailing business, that you can't um, process and support. So you may want to start one thing at a time or limited ability or simply start with a website and then move from there. So there certainly is the ability to phase in a website, which is the beauty of the Internet, that you can keep expanding it. It's not like uh, printing 5,000 copies of your brochure and having to throw it away. Um, that is expensive. This is part of the dark side of the force of technology. You can sink lots of money into technology, so you do have to plan very carefully and only buy what technology you need. Uh, if you don't need a lot of flash and online video and whatnots, is, don't put them on, or at least don't start out putting them on. So you do need to work very carefully with your website developer. Establish what your needs are, what you're trying to get out of the website, and look at a phased approach. The easiest way, and again, this parrots what Ian said, for us to develop something is to know your budget. But that's very uncomfortable for a client to walk in the room and say, well, I have this uh, $10,000 budget because automatically you know we're going to spend it on you. So it is kind of a, a back and forth between the developer and the client. The client saying, well, this is what I want. This is what I need. The developer saying, well, it sounds like this is it. Uh, can you afford this? If not, we'll look at phasing it back in. But the other thing to consider when you are developing your website and allocating your budget is your alternatives. You're going to be investing a serious amount of money in ent into any cataloging system, whether it would be mail order or internet order. And if you want to uh, look at comparative costs of what it would be to design a catalog to publish that multiple times a year to mail it out, uh, you may get some comparative costs, though I have not done it myself. But it, it's certainly not cheap, and you have to go into it knowing that this is a serious business investment and, and treat it as such. Yes, Kevin Chisholm <coughs> with Dine and Jen. Uh, in any... Uh, <laughs> I don't know uh, what, uh, what it is exactly that you're selling or, or how you want to go about selling it, but when I first went to Ian, uh, what's that? four years ago now, isn't it? Yeah. Goodness. Um, w I wanted something fairly simple, and something simple was basically what was, uh, what was provided. 
one of the things that a great number of people tell me today is that they appreciate going into my site and being able to navigate very, very easily. Uh, the more glitz you have on, a, on an internet site, the more difficult it is for a person to figure out where to go next. So it's the old KISS situation, and I really believe that you'll have far more success selling on the internet if you have a site which is easily navigated. The other thing is that uh, when, when Ian and I started with, with my database, there were maybe 400 items in it. There are now close to 7,000. And uh, I keep getting email. We were talking earlier about uh, uh, the email that comes down to you about what's available and what's not available and how you can make a million dollars and do this, that, and the other thing. I must get six to ten email messages a day from companies which want to offer me services where I can provide credit card business. And I take MasterCard and Visa and uh, Amex on the internet, and that's all I'm prepared to deal with at this particular point. Uh, there are other ways uh, that are coming uh, to collect money from people, but uh, as Paul had mentioned, the 10 cent transaction that costs the merchandiser or the, uh, the merchant uh, 50 cents or a dollar to process is hardly uh, worthwhile. So uh, that's one of the things that you've got to keep in mind, too, when you're putting, putting your site, uh, site up, what it's going to cost you to do business with whichever bank it is you're using. So uh, keep the site very, very simple. I went into Amazon.com this afternoon to try and find their auction site, and it took me about 10 minutes to figure it out. And when I went into eBay, to find some information on their auction site, it took me about a minute and a half. So the difference was the complexity of the site itself. So keep it simple. Uh, one, just one quick comment uh, I'd like to make as an architect. Uh, it's, I don't know if it's lost or occurred to anyone else, but uh, we're talking about building all these e-stores, and all the while it means the uh, disintegration of actually the brick and mortar stores. Uh, Egghead.com closed all their physical retail locations and so it, it's an issue that uh, a lot of uh, architects and uh, the building industry is, tr is trying to come to grips with and uh, one of the lessons that uh, we always like to apply that uh, goes a lot towards what uh, Alan is saying about keeping it simple is that uh, the same rules that apply in the real physical world uh, should apply perhaps to the online retail world in terms of how you use the psychology of design and wayfinding in similar ways that uh, provide uh, visual interest, uh, correlate to the uh, design image of the product itself, and also perhaps the image of the environment that uh, customers have become accustomed to in the real world. In other words, if um, customers are, and a lot has to do with cross-marketing. Uh, you can't just abandon one strategy and adopt a new one. You have to uh, develop the cross-marketing and the cross-links. And uh, you should not adopt a totally different design environment for your online presence than what you have in, in your uh, existing or old uh, real world presence. So uh, I just wanted to add that as being a visual design architect uh, that we feel that there's a lot of similarities between the cyber world and the real world. I would say there's a lot of software applications out there with hot links on uh, real uh, VR, as it's referred to, the photographic uh, panoramas, where you can find your hot spots and find your objects within the actual uh, QuickTime VR of the store and, and link to that, and that would uh, uh, go to the database. Yes, in, uh, in any uh, e-commerce transaction, the, the object is to have a cash transaction. Um, 
I've heard in uh, one case where um, a craftsperson was fined ten thousand dollars for uh, selling by credit card to somebody in the states. Apparently, there's some problem with the, a hidden trade barrier in that uh, if you sell uh, to individuals, there's perhaps a problem. And uh, perhaps you could comment on that. And then the second thing is the the difficulty of getting a, uh, a credit card uh, set up for uh, sa sales into the U.S. Uh, I'll try to be really brief on with this and not get uh, too technical, um, but fundamentally the banking system in Canada and the way that credit card transactions are handled uh, between the various banks in Canada uh, varies di uh, wildly from the way it's handled in the U.S. Uh, all the Canadian banks have to have individually negotiated agreements between one another on whether or not uh, the Royal Bank who handles Visa will actually process a MasterCard for the Bank of Montreal. And also in Canada, it's illegal for one bank to handle more than one credit card. Uh, in the States, it's a completely wide open internetwork of transaction exchanges uh, uh, that runs under the acronym GPS. Not to be confused with the global positioning system, I don't know what GPS stands for, but essentially in the States, um, a transaction gets processed by the GPS system and any credit card can be passed through any bank, banking institution. Um, so if you're headed towards the U.S. markets, there are a couple of outfits in Canada who uh, do transaction management services for you and they will handle your credit card transactions for a fee and they will pipe them through the U.S. transaction system. Or, alternatively, you can open up a U.S. bank account and do your business in, in U.S. currency or, or Canadian currency in a U.S. bank and uh, on, on occasion, depending on the volume of your business, I suppose, have the funds transferred back up here to Canada. That's the two, the two options for dealing with the credit card uh, woes. Uh, and I'm sorry, but I missed the first part of your question. Oh, the border cross border, right? Um, in some of the more more advanced uh, online shopping systems, uh, we're one of um, five uh, approved uh, web development partners for the MTNT uh, or MTT, as they are known now, um, electronic commerce uh, offering, uh, and their store system uh, is a very very comprehensive one that will allow you to set up. Uh, geographical boundaries, uh, not only based uh, because of tax implications, but there are several other things that, that also f come into play. Um, we've had a client come to us uh, looking to do um, e-business uh, with some uh, live fish, or, or uh, uh, crab actually, and uh, it was impossible for him to negotiate uh, a way to get that into the states reliably so that it wouldn't spoil. Uh, and his concern was uh, being able to sell it just in Canada, not overseas and not into the states. And it's now possible to do that. The Apple Store is an example of that. If you go to uh, store.apple.com, uh, I can't buy an Apple computer from the U.S. Apple Store, uh, much to my chagrin because I'd like to. But uh, it's easy to do that now simply by um, filtering the shipping information and not allowing people to, to have the ship to address be anywhere outside of the geographic er geographical area you specify. Yeah, I'm going to add a PS on the way over there. Uh, <laughs> but I think the point is here, technology may have uh, enhanced or perhaps complicated the transactions, but this has nothing to do with technology. This has to do with federal laws, banking laws, uh, commerce laws, customs, shipping. You do have to know the business and how you get to and fro the market, uh, no matter how you electronically communicate. Just uh, a little PS to that as well. All of my uh, listings on, on my website have prices in both Canadian and U.S. dollars. 
very early on, we figured out that we were not getting a lot of business from the United States because uh, the Canadian dollars appeared to be considerably more than the American dollar price. So the boys at Chatsubo built in a conversion system for me, and every morning I go in and check to see how the dollar closed the night before and update the website through the back end. As, as Ian said, I am able to go in and make minor changes. It's uh, not, uh, not easy, but it's not terribly difficult. Uh, so I can go in, change the, uh, the uh, amount uh, of the, uh, the dollar each day, and I can add and take out of the database things that have come in that wouldn't otherwise get there until the weekly update and, and take things out that are no longer available. As far as the credit card information is concerned, as I say, we take Visa, MasterCard, and, uh, and American Express, which are internationally accepted. All transactions go through my bank here in Sydney in Canadian dollars. And when the customer in the United States, and I'd suggest that probably 97 percent of our business is with the United States, uh, they will get on their monthly statement uh, a conversion unit just as you will if you purchase something in the United States. In American dollars, it's converted into Canadian dollars on the day of the transaction. It just goes the other way for the United States. Uh, I, want, I want to thank all four of our panelists, and uh, I hope now you can appreciate the wealth of experience and uh, expertise that they represent right here in the local area. It's one of the nice things of being able to pre give a presentation like this at the TAG is it makes you aware that you're not alone in your questions, but it also makes you aware of where you can go to get the answers. Uh, I'd like to thank Ian and Margaret and Spiro and Alan, and I hope that you all will take an opportunity to visit their websites, maybe drop down at their physical sites just to get a tie them two together, and I'd like to ask you at this time to join me in thanking them for coming and giving us the benefit of their spirit. Okay, now beat it. We're going to, uh, as Paul had mentioned earlier, we're going to carry uh, this theme of e-commerce throughout the next uh, uh, series of TAG meetings right up until June. So uh, if there are specific uh, issues, uh, that you want addressed or whatever, get a hold of Paul or myself or Lee, and we'll try to uh, we'll try to put together a, a program and, um, and and answer your questions. Okay, we're going to go right into the uh, good news. First, I'd like to uh, say uh, again, uh, we really appreciate the the presentation tonight. Paul, thank you very much for your overview. Uh, very uh, well presented and uh, very uh, uh, comprehensive overview. Uh, for the panelists, they all got something out of it tonight. Ian got a customer, I think, or a potential one anyway. Margaret told us all about a program that uh, will organize your personal life. Uh, now, Margaret, will that, will that tell me, like, what? No, maybe I'll ask you that afterwards, okay? We built everything. Yeah. And Spiro was talking about how the bricks and mortar is going, and he's not going to be an architect anymore. Maybe he's going to be an ecotech. I don't know if there is such a thing. And Alan uh, got a couple of plugs in by uh, getting his, his site mentioned at least 17 times. <laughs> so uh, thanks again for the panel. Our first showcase is Rachel DeVries, who's going to talk to us about uh, Smart Access 99 CAP workshop that's coming up. And while Rachel is coming down, I'd like to just draw your attention back to what Bob Morgan suggested regarding the presentations to this uh, uh, committee that's coming around about the economic development and so on. Bob's suggestion is very good. I can tell you that uh, there's no point in Paul or, uh, or uh, I going down to represent the TAG. I think it's uh, much more important if the private sector takes the lead and, uh, and uh, we'll help them in every way we can. But I can tell you something, when you're talking to the government, the private sector has a big voice and uh, they'll be looking for ideas. And I think the TAG has a pretty good reputation. So uh, together we should be able to put together fairly concise uh, uh, presentation with you to get their attention and then uh, later we'll go. Okay, Rachel, over to you. Careful, I don't read it. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is just a quick announcement about an upcoming conference. Um, Smart Access 99, the future of public access, will take place November 12th to 13th at the Gaelic College in St. Anne's. It uh, will be a focus on the discussion of public access issues and will bring together community representatives from the 58 CAP sites across the region and will also include representatives of industry, not-for-profit organizations and government agencies, all of which are involved in various aspects of public access. Smart Access 99 is a joint project of the three regional CAP networks, the Strait East Nova Community Enterprise Network, or SENSEN, the Victoria County CAP Sites Association, and the CAP Society of Cape Breton County. And the conference is funded by ECBC and Nova Scotia TSS. Now the three regional networks organizing the conference represent the six county region of Antigonish, Guysborough, Inverness, Richmond, Victoria, and Cape Breton counties. There are three main objectives of the conference. The first is to provide an opportunity for CAP organizers from various communities to meet face-to-face -face and exchange experiences and expertise. Second, the conference creates an opportunity to discuss sustainability issues facing community access sites and to do so from a community or grassroots perspective. At the same time, it also allows for a discussion of public access and its future from a more global perspective with those outside the community who are also involved in, in public access. Finally, and I think probably one of the most important points is that Smart Access 99 will strengthen the regional CAP network as a smart community. It should be noted that in the world of public access, this conference is an unprecedented example of communication and cooperation across regions and across regional networks in particular. It is also another example of the IT and organizational innovation that is occurring right here in our region. And Smart Access 99 also marks another major step in our continued growth as a smart community. This is a very abbreviated version of the program. We're going to open with a panel discussion on Friday evening uh, titled The Future of Public Access. And the panel will be made up of individuals from the public and private sectors. These will include uh, Craig Williams, who's formerly of the ACOA Enterprise Network out of Newfoundland, Dan Potter, CEO of Knowledge House, Kay Crinian, Nova Knowledge Executive Director, and Ron McNeil, who's an IT consultant at UCCB and with uh, our smart communities. On Saturday morning, uh, will be more or less the second part to the future of public access discussion. Um, it's another panel, panel session titled, Where Are We Now? Review and Preview. And this is essentially a response to the future of public access, but this time from within the CAP network. So there will be three people representing um, each of the regional networks in, within the region. Now this will be followed by a set of four sustainability workshops. And these will give CAP organizers an opportunity to address key challenges in sustaining community sites and to share their knowledge and expertise. The four sessions fall under the headings of operations, technical support, marketing, and community learning. And the afternoon will start with a forum, an open forum, on moving towards a smart community. And that is using the existing resources within the networks to enhance communication among communities and opportunities across the region. And I haven't put this on the slide, but we'll finish with a, a three sets of bell ringer sessions. So it'll be uh, about 15 in total. And these are short 20 minute presentations on a variety of topics ranging from technology issues to project management and identification and network news and information. So for more information, it says Smart Access 99, the future of public access at the Gaelic College in St. Anne's, November 12th and 13th. If you'd like more information in a, a uh, expanded version of the program, or the full version of the program, you can visit our website that is currently being hosted by the, Sen by the Sensen server, and it's sensen.ednet.ns.ca slash smart access. But by Monday, 
it will be available at smartaccess.net. Or you can email the conference organizers at smartaccess at straight.ednet.ns.ca. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Just be careful how you say smart access. Okay, Gail Whalen is here. Gail is the coordinator for Sensen, and uh, I was uh, going to ask Gail to come down and uh, introduce the, uh, a number of um, interns who are here, young people who are working out in the CAP site. So Gail will uh, tell you who they are. They'll stand up, identify themselves, and uh, no speeches, please. come in and get access to uh, the internet using computer facilities uh, provided through Industry Canada's CAP program, Community Access Program. Okay. Um, I'm Gail Whalen. I'm a project coordinator working with Sensen. And uh, once again, it's the Straight East Nova Community Enterprise Network. Um, currently, we're sort of uh, focusing on uh, youth immigration policy and a strategy for our, our communities, and the Strait Region actually encompasses four counties. Uh, it's Inverness, Richmond, Antigonish, and Guysboro. Um, right now, we have 14 youth working uh, within our network. In our communities, we actually work with uh, 53 communities, uh, 35 CAP sites, hopefully going to be more with this new CAP round. Um, uh, and then we're pretty much at our saturation point, but we have 68 points of access. So where we couldn't have 53 interns, we're fortunate to have the ability and the, t uh, the talent and the skills of the youth that we do have with us now. And we actually, with those 14, we've had a high uh, turnover rate. We've actually uh, lost, not necessarily lost, but uh, turned over 11 interns since the beginning of the program, which ran, uh, which started back in February 1st of 99. It's going to continue for a year, uh, one year. So it'll continue until January thir uh, 31st of 2000. And then hopefully with our funding partners, it's a, a funding project that's uh, sponsored by HRDC, Human Resources Development Canada, and TSS, the Technology Science Secretariat of the province. Um, so with those two partnerships, hopefully we'll be able to um, have the program last again for following year. And hopefully, right now we think that there's a possibility of uh, concluding or, with, or having it last for about three years. So. Um, with us this evening, we're actually just this afternoon, we were just down for a, a tour of Silicon Island, which was, which was excellent. We really enjoyed that. And so we thought that we'd stop by the TAG meeting this evening unannounced. But um, this evening we have with us four of our interns, and actually Rachel DeVries, and now she's working as a smart uh, researcher. Um, she was one of our interns, and where I had said we lost 14 interns, we've actually, the 11 that we've had that moved on, they have actually uh, stayed within the straight region and they've, they're working on uh, some full-time employment, which is excellent. It sort of um, backs up the whole idea of our youth uh, immigration strategy. Instead of our youth sort of leaving the area, we're trying to have them come back and, uh, and work within our own communities, which is sort of a key. Um, with us this evening, we have uh, four of our interns, Sheila Long, Manick Colton, um, Robert Oregon and Lloyd uh, Skinner. If I could ask you guys to stand, please. Um, <laughs> these four actually have a lot of great talents, a diverse background in, in education. It's sort of the key that's uh, been keeping our whole internship together. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have more of the interns with us this evening, but uh, sort of at short notice, we decided to come down this evening. So. What I'm going to do is just sort of probe you guys just for a little bit of what you've been doing. And as the coordinator, I'm well aware, but I think I'd, I'd rather have them share the information of what they've been doing in the communities that they've been working with. The idea of the internship is that um, they're to work with the CAP groups, the CAP committees, the community access uh, groups, engaging the communities uh, at large and building uh, and working on community capacity building. Um, 
Some of the interns right now, they're working on a, a various uh, projects. But each, as we know, each community is very different. And with the CAP groups, they're also very diverse and very unique. So each one of the communities actually work on their own projects. And they're not acting as staff in the, in the sites, but they're to work on projects and to help engage the communities. So perhaps I'll start with Lloyd. And Lloyd can just say, uh, once again, um, we know his name is obviously Lloyd Skinner, but just where he's working. Uh, what communities he's working with and some projects that he's uh, engaged in currently. Lloyd? Hang on a second. Hold on, Lloyd. I'm just going to grab the mic there, Lloyd. Thanks. Uh, the three CAP communities that I work for, I work for uh, the Sunnyville CAP community in uh, Lincolnville and Upper Big Trackety. Um, also, I'm the co-project uh, manager for the professional development team that we have existing with the, the Sensei and interns. Uh, our goal is to provide professional development for the interns to give them the employability skills and uh, talent so they can uh, either find a job after the internship's over and also to assist the CAF communities into, uh, into uh <coughs> sustainability and to provide programs for, for the individuals in, in each community. We actually have... Um Sorry, that was, sorry Lloyd, <laughs> not to take away. <laughs> um, where we do work with 53 of our communities, unfortunately we couldn't have 53 interns, but we do have 14, so obviously we have those 14 in clustered communities. So we have some of our interns in working from anywhere to two, uh, two communities to five communities. So uh, Lloyd works with three of the communities, and Robert Oregon is actually working with two. So Robert? Yes, uh, my name is Robert Organ. Uh, I represent Port Hawkesbury and a smaller community outside that known as Glendale. We're currently in the process of giving them capsite funding. The interesting thing about Glendale is that they, in all senses, aside from being the technical term, they are a capsite. They did not necessarily get the funding at this point, but they have a mandate. They have an active community site where there's uh, several terminals open. It's all volunteer run. And it's, uh, it's a typical public access site. Yeah, it's, in every sense of the word, it is a public access site, minus the funding, but that's hopefully coming. Hopefully coming. Get my plug in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some, one of the projects that I am working on with the Sensen Group is I'm a co-project worker on the marketing project, which we're developing for the Sensen organization, but also we're trying to develop a, a model for the CAP communities and the CAP sites to develop a marketing strategy for their, as a revenue generation and just uh, exposure. Uh, uh, some of the other things that I do with the uh, CAP sites, with my CAP sites, is I divide or I provide assistance w in uh, technical or web solutions or IT solutions with the community organizations in my area and outside the area with the network of interns that we have. Thank you. Robert has actually worked on uh, in partnership with or in part with Alan McMillan. Uh, another intern that we've just actually recently lost um, to Advanced Glazings, but um, he's actually worked on the Smart Access website, so that's one of the projects that Robert has been working on. Um, another one of our interns is Minick Colton. Minick, could you stand, please? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Minick Colton. I'm the intern in the Mulgrave Monastery and Harbor Bushy Cap sites. Um, other than working, right now we're working with a few different organizations doing introduction to computer courses and just familiarizing them with the CAP sites. I'm also working on a community networking project with three other interns who couldn't make it tonight. Uh, what we're doing is we're trying to get all the, uh, it's in the four counties that Sunsen works in and we're getting all of the uh, community businesses and organizations and of course the CAP site. We're trying to get a meeting where everyone's together we can uh, share ideas, let everyone know what everybody else is doing, so we can all help each other out. And absolutely, and last but not least, is uh, Sheila Long. Sheila? Uh, hi, my name is Sheila Long, and I work at uh, the Anaganish and St. Joseph's CAP sites. And basically what I'm doing now, I'm working with Robert Organ. We're doing a uh, marketing campaign for Sensen to create awareness around the Quad Counties and to get uh, increased community economic development in the sites through the information technology that we have at the centers. Okay, thank you very much to Gail and to the, uh, the interns for coming here this evening. Please come back anytime for a tag meeting. Our next uh, 
uh, announcement is from Dr. Slava Lamont, who's from the Center for uh, Environmental Research, UCCB. Thanks, Jim. <coughs> Excuse me. I prepared uh, an introduction which could actually take us at least one tag meeting. <laughs> um, I wanted to emphasize um, that um, the UCCB is always recognizing the role it must, must play in the economic expansion on our island. And that there have been substanti uh, substantive investments in infrastructure and spe specialized, specialized programming. Uh, I want to talk about uh, many of them, just about one, and this is the Center for Environmental Research, which was uh, uh, newly established. The Center for Environmental Research was established um, in the spirit of UCCB's commitment to link primary and applied research with community needs and input. <coughs> the Center belongs at, at the university to the Department for Economic and Technical Innovation. Next, please. Other centers belonging to this department are the Technology Enterprise Center, the CAD-CAM Center, GIS GPS, Center for Excellence in Information Technology, Center of Excellence in Offshore Petroleum Development and uh, Petroleum ed Education, and of course, the Center for Environmental Research. All these centers are linked through one common central idea, and this is innovation. Next. Innovation, as we perceive it, is a process that begins with creation of knowledge in the research and continues through its application for the benefit of the community. And here we em emphasize the application and the benefit of the community. The Center <coughs> for Environmental Research will be looking, of course, uh, at uh, research concerning the envir environmental past, as well as looking ahead. The um, methodology we are going to use in order to, de to, to develop the center and develop the expertise um, will be starting with the, with the um, available expertise at the university um, and, um, and mostly through cooperation agreements and MOUs with um, um, national and international centers of excellence. Currently, we, ha we do have um, MOUs and uh, cooperation agreements with Coast Guard College, Daltech, uh, University of Waterloo, which is a very important uh, one for us, and uh, some, other, uh, some other centers, mm, not, um, not th the last uh, is the UFZ Center um, for environmental research in Leipzig Halle in Germany. <coughs> Excuse me. UFZ means um, Umweltforschungszentrum. That's just for Bob. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> what are the objectives of the center? Um, the objectives are to conduct interdisciplinary research and training in areas of direct importance to the region, including ecology, health, and remediation to develop marketable knowledge and expertise in these areas, serving as an engine for, for the development and enhancement of specialized small and medium-sized enterprises, and to address the economic development of the region, supporting cluster building of knowledge-based industry. The areas of our future research will include remediation technologies and strategies for soil, <coughs> and sediments, groundwater and drinking water, estuaries and other surface water bodies, regional emissions of organic pollutants and their toxicological effects on humans and ecosystems, and urban ecology, um, and uh, there the ecological and socio-ecological community development problems, uh, 
a sustainable community development belongs to uh, these problems and uh, ecological economic aspects. The next one, please. Uh, the other areas, uh, the other, uh, the fourth area of um, our um, future research we are going to address is dynamics of biological communities, biodiversity analysis of natural biological resources and sustainability of natural evolution as the basis of life. Analysis and measurement of the genetic effects of, uh, of anthropogenic activities. And our last plan is biological and principles for environmental technologies and biotechnologies. So these are the areas you identified for our research. Um, I won't give any more examples. If anybody of you has uh, questions, please address me by phone or fax. My name is Suarel Mont. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slav. I think it's an indication of how important UCCB is to the future economy and, uh, and society in Cape Breton with all those centers of excellence uh, that are so relevant to the community and to the, to the new economy. Um, a few more announcements. Tom Campbell from uh, Tom, Thomas A. Campbell uh, Systems or whatever he's called, he's uh, looking for a partner and a manager for his Johnstown office. There is a notice on the tag list. If anybody has any, uh, is interested in that, uh, just check the tag list and there's an, an email from Tom on there. The Atlantic Digital Media Festival is from the 28th to the 30th of October. There's a record number of entries have been submitted for uh, competition. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, check the Media Fusion uh, website to get the uh, contact on how to register. Uh, Paul Wareham, I got a, a note here, a uh, press release from Quebec City last week or a couple of days ago. Um, Paul Wareham, the president of Dynagen Systems, was awarded the uh, Young Entrepreneur Award uh, for Nova Scotia by the Business Development Bank of Canada. So uh, please join me in congratulating <laughs> Paul. Paul is only 28 years old. Imagine what he's going to be able to do when he gets to be my age. Not very much, right? Yeah, right. Um, there will be an e-commerce seminar. I guess we're uh, flogging e-commerce to death. Uh, there will be an e-commerce seminar presented by uh, CTEC at uh, UCCB on the 17th of November. It will be from 8 in the morning till uh, 4. Uh, there will be a series of sessions starting then. And there'll be also be an evening session planned. If you want any information on that, uh, you can contact uh, Fred White, who's one of the uh, instructors here at UCCB, at 563-1228. And I think Fred, are you here, Fred? Yes, Fred is there if you want to talk about that. Uh, for registration, see him. Uh, Helix Digital Inc. Is anybody here from Helix Digital Inc.? I didn't see Richard tonight. There is a job fair. Uh, there was an announcement in the paper. So uh, Helix Digital is starting to hire. So there's a job fair. Uh, check the uh, local media or give Richard a call uh, to find out. I'd like to welcome back Cecil Smith from ECBC from his sabbatical. Um, <laughs> is Holly Grant here? Holly, she had to go? OK. Um, Holly was sent around a, a, a notice to us. And there was a note in the paper about a um, human resources advisory group that was meeting at Silicon Island. It met this afternoon. I don't know exactly what happened. I was going to ask her to give me an update. But in any case, there's another meeting on October 28th. Uh, the purpose is to get people together who are, are looking uh, for a job and how to find one and, and try to provide an informal, less uh, threatening environment for people to learn a bit about, uh, about uh, job uh, searches and so on. Okay? So uh, there was an ad in the paper on, on, uh, on that this week. But if you want uh, information on that, you can contact Holly Grant at 539-2682. Um, the Canadian Technology Network Maritimes is having a meeting in Charlottetown PEI on November 18th and 19th. Um, it's free to UCCB uh, members and members of non-profit organizations. So anybody who's a member of TAG, tell them I said you get in for free. Uh, Denzel Doyle will be giving a presentation on the 19th. You remember we had him here last year for a, a workshop on making technology happen. And there's also another individual there, Dr. Ferrers Clark, 
uh, who we understand from CISTI, from the Can Canada Institute for Scientific and Technical Information, who apparently is a very good presenter. We may get him down here for one of the future TAG meetings. There's also quality. Tomorrow there's a quality in the next millennium uh, workshop uh, here at uh, the Days Inn in uh, uh, Sydney from 8.15 till noon. Uh, there's no charge for this event, so um, you can, you know, you go get yourself free lunch or whatever. Uh, for registration, contact uh, Leanne McKenzie at the Tech Center, 567-2100, or Sammy Schwartz. I think I saw Sammy here. Sammy's here in the audience. Talk to Sammy about that. Uh, the last thing I want to do very quickly now is to uh, whistle through a presentation that we gave at Nova Knowledge, uh, Lee Singleton and myself. And um, as, a result of the, as a result of our work at TAG, TAG was awarded the Smart Organization uh, Award for Nova Scotia by Nova Knowledge. So uh, I accepted the award. Uh, Lee and I accepted the award on behalf of all of uh, members of the TAG. So I want to thank everyone uh, for their participation over the years. And um, it's, it's, it's a, an honor to, uh, for all of us to get an award uh, uh, recognizing our work uh, in the province of Nova Scotia by uh, a, an organization like Nova Knowledge. But I won't take up too much time. I just want to flick through these slides. So let, the, let it rip, and uh, I'll take the next one. I'm not going to say too much on it. This is just to show you what we talked about, our mandate next. Some of the objectives of TAG. If you don't agree with them, well, give us some new ones. <laughs> uh, next one. We talked about the format. We told them how we run the meetings, more or less, and some of the things that we, we try to do. Next. Um, some of the benefits. Next. I know when to change the slide, because I just watched Bob Morgan. When his lips stopped moving, I changed the slide. <laughs> you notice that we took uh, credit for uh, Silicon Island. Uh, Art and Innovation Center, that was one of our, uh, we, we took the credit for that. Next. <laughs> yeah. So we just tried to give them an overview, you know, of what, what it is we were doing at TAG. Next. And we talked about the history. Next. <laughs> Lee is saying next. Yeah. Okay, I think there's one more after that. And we just talked about the vision. There's no reason. TAG has been imitated by many groups, and uh, they've tried to imitate the format. And they say that imitation is the greatest form of flattery. So we're very flattered because there's ver many groups who've, who've uh, tried to imitate this format, and we think that's wonderful. If you can apply it to your organization, great. There's no reason in five years we can't have a national network of TAG or TAG-like organizations. Okay, and then next. Okay, and uh, this quote, I love this quote. I really do. Now, you might look at it and say, huh, big deal. What's so friggin' special about that? Well, this quote is from Jim Pierce. I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> so, the next meeting is November 18th at, uh, here at uh, UCCB. And we will um, now uh, go on to the first of our, sec of our two networking sessions. The first one will be held down in the multipurpose room. Um, so have coffee. Thank you very much for coming. And the second one, you have to ask Bob Morgan where that is. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>